Hello and welcome to Iron Views TV, the show that already has more fans than Millwall Football Club. On this week's episode, we'll reflect on a very frustrating deadline day for West Ham. We'll travel back in time to a highly eventful period for the club and make our predictions for another tough match, this time against Man United. On the show today, I'm delighted to welcome two men similar in age but very different in footballing ability, ex-West Ham winger Matt Etherington and promoter and agent William Storey. Gentlemen, great to have you on the show. Hi. But unfortunately, we've got to start off at slightly more negative terms, looking back at that defeat to Liverpool, again at Anfield, unable to get a result. With the team so close in the table and West Ham playing so well this year, do you not think this is the sort of game we should maybe be doing a bit better in, Matt? Yeah, maybe. I, looked, I watched the game and didn't really create many chances going forward, so that would be disappointing. Uh, Sam set the team up a little bit too defensively, probably. Liverpool were there for the taking, especially at the back. So, yeah, disappointing result, and Liverpool were by far the better team on the day. Well, what did you make of it? Yeah, I mean, I think the Anfield hoodoo continues, doesn't it? I don't think we've won there since 63. Uh, you'd have thought with, the, with how well we're doing and good players, we'd have done better this year. But as Matt said, you know, we were so negative, we didn't look like we believed we were going to go for the win. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think Liverpool were there for the taking. You know, they're not that good this year. And uh, if we put it on them a little bit earlier, then we could have had a good chance. But, you know, again, it's very disappointing. But hopefully we'll get a win at Anfield sometime. Well, one player that was talked about, about a lot after that game was Stuart Downing, who was pushed out wide where he hasn't been playing as well, whereas in central attacking midfield, he's been sort of our, our shining light this season. Why do you think Sam Allardyce isn't giving him that role all the time, Matt? I don't get it. I really don't. I think he's been outstanding, especially the early part of the season when he was playing more centrally and he was getting on the ball. I know Stuart well and... Uh, I trained West Ham for a few weeks in, over pre-season and he actually asked the manager if he could play a bit more centrally this year because mm. you get asked to do a hell of a shift out on the wing and he's not getting any younger, I think he's in his 30s now, so he, he really wants to play in that position and I know he's very frustrated that he's not playing there week in, week out because he's performing in there, so mm. I don't get it. Uh, obviously the manager has to cater for players sometimes, uh, formations to stop teams etc, but He's been their, West Ham's arguably their best player this year, so for me, you've got to play him in his best position. Yeah, and obviously in that diamond formation is where West Ham looked to be creating the most chances. Carroll seems to thrive far uh, more in that system. Obviously, he's going to be injured for a few weeks now, which will maybe see Sacco and Valencia uh, come back as the striking duo. Do you think that might help West Ham push on after a slight blip? 100%, yeah, but I mean, I think Downing, I agree with Matt, Downing's been a revelation this year, and I think he's, uh, that's certainly his position. Mm. I think he's a confidence player. I think if a manager shows he believes in him and gives him free reign, he, he, can, he can deliver, and he's done that this year tremendously. And I think Sacco has been phenomenal, mm. and Valencia is obviously very pacey. So, um, yeah, we look dangerous, and uh, I can't understand why Downing wasn't in the hole against uh, Anfield, for sure. Do you think maybe Sam Allardyce still hasn't quite evolved as much as West Ham fans would have liked to have thought in the last year? I mean, there was a lot of uh, criticism in the last season that he was playing too negatively. Obviously, ha he has improved, but do you think maybe there are still signs showing that he hasn't really progressed as much as we'd liked? I don't think you can be too downbeat as a West Ham fan. It's been a great season up to now. Yeah. Uh, last year, it wasn't great at all, was it? So this season is still going well. still in the FA Cup, high in the table can only push on and, and hopefully get in a European place. That would be amazing for West Ham mm. if we can do that this year and, and hopefully uh, be able to do that. Well, Will, we've got this clip of you from uh, uh, the pilot last season uh, slating Big Sam. Uh, so we can have a look at that now, see Will's negative comments. Well, personally, as a fan, I would say that he shouldn't. Uh, but I think his remaining in the post is symptomatic of a malaise that's afflicting the club that is actually coming from above, Sam. He is a symptom of a greater problem, which is the current ownership of the club, in my opinion. Um, and Big Sam is their man. So he's actually doing what he's told. He's keeping us in the Premier League, which is his, his number one, you know, if you like, objective. So he's actually doing his job. Um, so it's hard to see where you can go, because I think for a new manager to come in, he needs to be given funds and greater sort of impetus. So I do think Sam is the wrong man. He doesn't play the right style, uh, but I fear that he will remain because he's, he's their man. So fast forwarding to the present day, William, looking back at those comments, have you uh, changed your mind on Sam Allardyce? Well, I think partially. I mean, you can't criticise the team this year. He's obviously done a brilliant job this year. They're motivated playing as a unit, um, you know, and you've got to say he's done a great job. But I think the criticisms I had last year do remain to an extent. One was over transfer policy um, and the use of certain, you know, only certain avenues to get players which weren't necessarily in the club's interest and paying big, big money for those players. 
And secondly, um, you know, he can't rein in his conservative attitudes. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, he does have a problem with going for things and he wants to play safe all the time. What you do get is almost a guarantee to be in a Premier League, a solid defensive unit, and you know what you get. So, listen, he, he's a good manager. He's an excellent Premier League manager. I like him very much as a person. So, um, you know, on the basis of this year, he does have to stay. But, um, you know, as I say, I think there are some weaknesses there. But I think David Sullivan taking over a lot of transfer policy mm -hmm. has probably eradicated that. And Matt, do you think West Ham would be mad to get rid of Allardyce with only one season left until that Olympic Stadium move? I think so, definitely. You, you know with Big Sam that he'll guarantee you Premier League football, no matter what anyone thinks of him. He's done that all throughout his career. So with the stadium move coming up, I think it's imperative they keep him at least for another season and then take it from there. He's still not signed a new contract, so who knows what the chairman is thinking and Sam's thinking. But I think it's imperative for West Ham Football Club for him to stay at the club next season. Well, uh, following that Liverpool game, where Sam obviously didn't uh, do exactly what uh, West Ham fans had expected, I caught up with James Goodison, who also writes for IMG News, to get his thoughts on the game, formation and all the other talking points. I'm joined now by IMG News writer James Goodison. James, welcome. Hi, Liam. How are you doing? Yeah, very yeah. well. Very well, thanks, mate. Um, so, unfortunately, it was another disappointing result at Anfield. What do you think went wrong at the weekend? Uh... Well, I, I just, um, I just, I was so surprised about how how we seemed to sort of approach the game. Um, I mean, Allardyce sort of he made it seem like we were we were going to be going for it. We weren't going to be we weren't going to be playing any any negative football. And it, it, it just seemed to me like when when we got into the game, um, we 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 didn't we didn't really show anything at all. And I thought it was very strange how he decided to use Downing uh, as well. Obviously, one of our best players this season. Um, sort of being shunted out again um, to the right. The the midfield uh, in itself seemed uh, arranged in a way which which hasn't really worked in the past. Um, obviously, the ta the tactics, of course, is one thing to discuss. Thought there were a couple of poor performances um, on the pitch as well. I don't think Song uh, played particularly well, which is a shame, really, after his after his uh, run of form earlier in the season. Um, and I find it he sort of slipped off a bit recently, which I find strange. Um, and then out of the match, we've got to worry about, of course, Andy Carroll and his injury and see how that all goes. Do you not think that maybe with Carroll out of the side for a few weeks, we might see the return to the clinical partnership of Sacco Valencia that served us so well at the beginning of the season? Well, I would like that, um, certainly. I think that we definitely, that something changed when Carroll came back in. Um, I'm not, I mean, we, uh, the results were, were strange, but they were, I, think they, I think it's been masked how much Carroll has changed the side by the fact that he's been scoring lots of goals and performing relatively well uh, as well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, he himself uh, is at fault for it, but more the tactical decisions which, which influence the other players around him. I would love for Sakon Vlets to come back I don't, uh, into the side as a partnership or two. I don't know how, um, how it's going with that Senegal thing, uh, the FA and, and FIFA and everything at the moment either, and I'm not sure exactly how the rules work, which means he could play, but I certainly would like to see Sakon and Valencia back in the side. Of course, that... That also brings worry about um, our bench uh, with, with, with injuries and everything because, of course, Zorate is on loan and Carroll is injured. We've only got uh, Colton Cole uh, to sit on the bench uh, as, a, as a striker. So we just have to hope that Sacco's back injury doesn't sort of flare up again. Now, moving on to one of the days that is meant to be the busiest in the year, transfer deadline day. Unfortunately, West Ham were unable to do any business despite tracking a number of players throughout the cross of the window. Matt, do you think there are any, um, any players West Ham should have looked to sort of prioritise and bring in or maybe some positions that needed strengthening? I think you've got a well-balanced squad at the minute, if I'm honest. The Darren Fletcher one surprised me because I don't think they need another holding midfielder. Mm. We've already got Mark Noble there and um, someone's gone off the ball a little bit lately, but he's still a class act. Uh, Centre-halves are well covered. I know Reed his contract's fit up at the end of the season, so maybe bringing in another centre-half uh, could have been an idea, but apart from that, the squad looks strong and it looks balanced. So I didn't think there was a necessity to bring anyone in. Adebayo was talked about, you know what you're going to get with Adebayo, mm -hmm. he'll probably turn it on for a few months and then he'll go missing. So uh, I think that, you know, it, that was probably a good thing for West Ham that, um, that he didn't sign. You've got Sacco, you've got Andy Carroll, Valencia, plenty of options there. So I don't think it was a necessity to, to spend any money really in January. I know all fans want new players in, fresh faces to to freshen things up and, and to look forward to, but it doesn't always have to happen and I'm sure the manager and the chairman are more than happy with the squad they got. 
Well, uh, William, someone who's been key to our success so far this season is Alex Song. Um, lots of fans are hopeful that he'll sign a permanent deal, yep. potentially. But Wally Downs on the sofa last week thinks that this is just a um, sort of a step, stepping stone to get Song back in the limelight, and he doesn't really have his heart set on a uh, West Ham move. What do you what do you think? Is well, the I, th I think it could be truth on both sides there. I mean, ultimately, you look at Winston Reid. I mean, I hear he's off to Tottenham on big money. Um, but going back to the transfer window, I mean, I. You know, I think there's an opportunity if you're fifth, sixth in the table mm. to really press home the advantage. I agree the squad's very strong, but it would be a chance to maybe make one or two marquee signings and really make a big, bold statement mm -hmm. because that could give you that extra momentum to push on for, for Champions League. And, you know, we're falling away a little bit now. Now, I know top ten's a great, great achievement mm -hmm. for us this year, but, you know, it's just... I'd like to see real ambition. We've got, we're going to have one of the best stadiums in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're one of the biggest clubs in the Premier League now, so... You know, a little bit of, uh, you know, if you like, investment now could really press home the advantage. Well, we can look back at the uh, eight players we were linked with on uh, deadline day. Um, hopefully, as you can see here, there's a few uh, few big names on there. Adebayor, Gomez, two strikers we were uh, considering. Do any of those names sort of take oh, your fancy? No, that's exactly. <laughs> They're not exactly marquee names, are they? I, I know what uh, William's saying in regards to getting that big marquee signing in. It, it would be a boost for the football club and mm. if we've got aspirations of getting into the top uh, the top six and getting into Europe etc but I don't think there's that many players out there and, and January as everyone says is a notoriously very difficult month to mm. to navigate in the transfer window so maybe West Ham are better off waiting to the summer. Well someone that's always talked about talk about with their uh, sensationalist move back to West Ham is Carlos Tevez. Uh, you've obviously played with the man a little bit do you see him ever returning to Upton Park? He always speaks about his love for the club and it seems genuine as well. So, you know, he was a hero to the fans when, when he was at West Ham. So th I think there could be a chance. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> and that would be some occasion if he did come back, definitely. William, are we just dreaming hopelessly there? Or? I'm, sure, I'm sure he'd prefer to live in London than Manchester. <laughs> and uh, I think he was homesick at one point, wasn't mm. it? But he's, I think his wife might now be convinced London's a nice place. I don't know. I mean, listen, he's a great player, but, but ultimately you get best value when you've got young, hungry players rather than necessarily people looking for a final payday. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people we've signed. I mean, I'm thinking of when we re-signed McAvenny back many years ago and we even got Paolo Futre, if you remember, who was probably one of the best players in the world but was unfit. So if you could get 10, 15, 20 games a year out of him, then 100% and it would be fantastic for the club. But realistically, I think you'd probably be paying well over the odds for someone who, who might be well past it. Well, stay on transfers, Matt. Can you explain what it's like from a player's point of view when you find out an interest and how the whole process works? Yeah, first and foremost, yeah, your agent will give you a call and, and tell you there's a club interested. If the club are willing to let you go, then you go up and speak to the club. It's, it's a nervy time, especially if you think you are. there is a chance of you leaving. It can unsettle you a little bit. Mm. Uh, I don't believe, I don't believe the tran January transfer window especially is any good, really. It just disturbs players, it disturbs managers from focusing on what's really important, and that's mm. getting results. So um, it's a bit, a bit of a nonsense for me, personally. Uh, so now, casting our minds back to a May afternoon in Wales, 2006, obviously the FA Cup final against Liverpool, one of the most memorable days in West Ham's recent history, sadly for some of the wrong reasons. Uh, Matt, can you talk us through that day, sort of from start to finish and everything from your point of view? Yeah, obviously, that's first of all a day I'll never forget, uh, for good reasons and bad reasons, obviously the bad reason being the result. Prior to that game, I'd really uh, badly twisted my ankle in training. Christian Daly went through me and uh, I tore all the ligaments in my ankle two weeks before the game, so I didn't even know if I was going to make it. I spent uh, the majority of those two weeks in a hyperbaric chamber where it um, basically gets all your blood flowing and gets the bruising out quicker. So um, so I didn't, I didn't train a lot, but luckily enough, Pardew put me in the starting 11. I thought, thought the team played well, thought I played well. It, it was an unbelievable day. We went 2-0 up. Uh, just you know, unbelievable scenes really. Mm. <laughs> and Liverpool gradually come back into the game as all top sides do. But we weathered the storm conscious, scored the uh, cross come goal. And I thought we were gonna hold on. I come off with five minutes to go, uh, more than happy with what I produce and, and the team. And I, I was saying earlier, I spoke to Ginge and James Collins and said to him, can you imagine the night we're gonna have tonight? You know, we're, we're gonna go down in history. You know, st people still talk about the 1980 team uh, as legends and we could have been in, you know, held in that same esteem and unfortunately Stephen Gerrard's popped up and 
done what he's done for Liverpool for many, many a year, and uh, it was just heart wrenching. And the change room after, I've never experienced anything like it. You know, the lads were literally in bits. There was tears a lot, and no one basically spoke to each other. We were just absolutely devastated because we genuinely thought we'd won it, and we deserved to win it as well. So to have it taken away from us like that was was really hard to take. But it was it was a good team, a young, hungry team. Uh, we'd done well that season, I think. Finished eighth, did we, or something? Yeah, I think something like that. Yeah, something like that. So we had a, we had a great year. It was just so unfortunate the way that uh, cup final played out and. There was hardly anyone left to take any penalties at the end. You look at Anton taking a penalty and think, you know, if players like me and uh, Dean Ashton were still on the pitch, maybe we would have won that shoot shoot out. But all ifs and buts, it wasn't to be. And just, you know, talking about it now makes my stomach churn. I can't believe that I've not got an FA Cup winner's medal. Yeah, I'm sure all the viewers now will be shedding a few tears. <laughs> William, were you crying to your pillow yeah, that well, night? I actually watched the game at Upton Park, funnily enough. They had the screens, they did a, a special thing and... Uh, so I watched it at Upton Park and um, yeah, it was absolutely gutsy. I mean, I thought Dean Ashton was phenomenal that was, day. Yeah. Um, and for me, he was could have become one of England's best ever strikers. Mm. And it was devastating really for every fan of West Ham, uh, what happened with on England duty, ironically, uh, mm. for his injury, because he seemed to have a combination of Shearer and Sheringham and he had everything about him. And, and that day he was class um, and we just couldn't believe it really. And Gerard popped up and... Whether we went to sleep a little bit or, or whether we felt we'd already done enough, I, d I don't quite know. But um, yeah, it was gutting. But we'll, uh, yeah, we'll hopefully get there again soon enough. Maybe this season. Um, and obviously, following that defeat, everything sort of seemed to fall apart with the Padre reign at West Ham. I mean, we were fighting a relegation battle for the whole of the next season. What do you think was the main factor behind that sort of downturn in form? Was it the um, morale sort of? Def uh, deflating effect of the FA Cup? Was it Pardew's errors? Was it sort of player rouse within, within the team? It was a mixture of both. The new owners come in the following season. Uh, they wanted to change things about. I think they wanted to change the manager. That was always in the back of the head. Uh, so players were starting to feel uneasy. Tevez and Mascarano come in so that you know, players are wondering whether they're going to be in the team, etc. Uh, there's a mixture of everything, really. Alan Pardew was a good manager. People, a lot of people got a lot of opinions on him. Me personally, I've always said this, he was a very good manager. Tactically, he was very good. I know he's made mistakes since mm -hmm. uh, that we all know about. Uh, and some will probably say he's having himself a little bit. <laughs> but he was a good manager and he's he done well for West Ham. And I think it's important people remember that. Well, one of the players who was talked about a lot that season was Nigel Rio Coca, who um, is labelled as a traitor now then uh, for his departure from the club and because he uh, he sort of claimed he'd been a scapegoat hung out to dry uh, what, what were your thoughts on that whole situation well, I thought there was there was obviously some kind of destabilizing influence at the club and mm. because a lot of stories were coming out and you wonder where that was coming from so somebody had something against Pardew for sure because there was a lot of stuff coming out that he wouldn't have authorized uh, but there was all the press stuff about the Bentley boys I don't know if you remember that where it was Rio Coca Anton Ferdinand a few other people with discipline issues um, I don't know what was going on, but I mean, there's obviously a little bit more to it. But I agree with Matt. Alan, uh, Alan Pardew is a, is a very good manager. He plays good football, um, tactically astute. Um, so, to be honest, it was a bit of a shame what happened. Um, I think if you're talking about Rio Coca in particular, what's happened to his career afterwards, mm -hmm. um, not very much. And, you know, it strikes me a little bit of the Ravel Morrison about him. He's, he's someone who has issues with different people and maybe he needs to look at himself more than anyone else. But um, for sure, you know, Pardew did really well. And I think there was a lot of turbulence, as Matt said, with, with ownership, mm. a lot of stuff going on. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it was a shame. But we, we had some good football there. And uh, as you said, we did very well getting to, uh, to the cup final. Well, Pardew, obviously, he's uh, doing well at Palace at the moment, just joined there. But could you see him being one of the men to maybe take West Ham forward at the Olympic Stadium? Could he come back as manager one day, do you think, Matt? I think so. I spoke to to Alan Pardew after he left West Ham and it, mm. I said I said thank you to him for for what he'd done for me personally he was good to me he got West Ham up through the playoffs the first season we we lost it that was, was a bad game against Palace the second season we got promoted and the next season we're back at Millennium Stadium again in a cup final so he delivered some good times to West Ham mm. fans and he was genuinely gutted that he'd left the club he thought he could take the club on even further but it was just a timing that was so unfortunate I think with the with the new owners coming in uh, them not really wanting Pardew there, wanting to change things about when it didn't really need changing if, if we're honest, well, if I don't think it did. So it was just unfortunate that, that circumstances prevailed like that but he was, he was genuinely gutted that he left West Ham. 
in the way he did, and I think he'd definitely like to come back. Well, the man who came in to replace Pardew, Alan Kerbishley, obviously fairly highly rated by West Ham fans, but perhaps do you think that's uh, not quite accurate of his time at the club? He did OK at uh, West Ham, um, saved, saved from relegation that year. He had an awful lot of money to spend. Did he spend it wisely? I don't think so. Um, he didn't have a lot about him as a manager, mm. to be completely honest with you. Uh, he was <laughs> he wasn't very charismatic to say the least, but you, know, you don't get on with everyone, I suppose. And he was he was he was a manager that I couldn't really warm to, and and that was just me. Well, what were your thoughts? Yeah, on Yeah, well, I thought Kirby did do very well, at, you know, at Charlton over a long period of time, and he brought through some good players. Obviously, Rob Lee, who then went on to to play for West Ham, and yeah. there's a few others, Matt Holland as well. Um, but I think the uh, I don't know. I mean, it, he might have been a certain type of club man. You know, given resources, he wasn't very good. Um, and certainly I'm thinking of Kieran Dyer and Lundberg were disastrous purchases, massively over the odds for basically people who are injury prone. Um, no one else wanted them, you know. So ultimately he didn't do that, didn't do that well. Um, wouldn't say he's the worst manager West Ham have ever had, but certainly I'd, I'd rate Pardew. I think Pardew's done very, very well. He had to put up with an awful lot of nonsense from Newcastle fans. Um, and I think he emerged from that with tremendous credit and he's already doing a great do job at Palace. So um, it's good to hear what, what Matt said, that he, he was sad about leaving the club and you never know, he's a dynamic young manager. So uh, Could come back one day. Yeah. Yeah. Now, moving on to the Tweets of the Week segment. Every week we get a few of you to send in your questions for our special guests. Matt, there's a few up here um, you can take a crack at. So ask Matty, who's the best West Ham player you've played with? Uh, Obviously, Tevez would be the obvious answer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with Michael Carrick when I first joined the club. I think he was with us for a season. And uh, he was my room partner at the time as well. I got on really well with him. Uh, just a, a fantastic footballer in every, in every way. Uh, and he's proved he's, how many years he's been Man United now. Mm -hmm. And a great lad as well. So I'll go with Mickey Carrick, yeah. Fair enough. And then next up. Um, so if you had your time again, would you have liked to stay at West Ham? Yeah, definitely. I've always said it, uh, West Ham are the team I follow now, always have been, and the way I left the club left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth, but it was all my own doing, and, I, and I've said that previously. It, I needed to go, but I didn't want to go, but it was the right thing for me to do. Um, if I had my time again, I'd, I'd definitely do things differently, but you live and learn from your mistakes. The one thing when you get older is you definitely mature as a person and as a man, and, and I've done that, and I've learned from my mistakes, and as long as I've learned from them, that's all I can, that's all I can ask, really. Well, you mentioned earlier that Zola rated you highly as mm. a player. Um, so was it just unfortunate that it just wasn't quite the right type of place for you to continue yeah. your career? When he first came into the club, he was playing the two inverted wingers in behind the striker and he wanted me to get on the ball and, and he really liked me as a player. And he actually, I had issues with my back then that's ultimately led me to retire now. And he'd help me with his, his yoga that he'd always do and one-on-one -on -one sessions and things like that. So he's investing time in me. And when a manager does that, um, you know, they obviously rate you. Uh, it was just unfortunate that, obviously, well documented my personal issues and my gambling, etc. My head wasn't there at the time, and I, I, that's one of the big regrets I have is because I had a lot of time for Zola, a legendary player, as we all know, but he was a good manager and a good man, and mm. I can't believe that I was getting that advice and that um, time from one of one of the Premier League's great, and I wasn't taking it in. Like, yeah. stupid stupidity when I think about it now, but, like I said, you, you live and learn, and I've definitely learned from that one. <laughs> sure. And then, um, here we go, so yeah, uh, what was your best moment in a West Ham show? There's a fair few. Um. Yeah, it's, it's got to be the goal at the, at the bowling under the lights against Ipswich in the, in the playoff semi-final. I know we didn't go up that year, but I got hammered a year that year as well. Um, and that goal and the feeling I got from that goal is, is unbelievable, really. So it's, I've, you still, I still play on YouTube every now and again <laughs> because the crowd went absolutely mental. Pardew's running in the crowd. It was just a great moment, and uh, that, that's that was my favourite moment. Will, do you have any Matt Etherington moments that sort of sit fondly? Well, I remember I was, uh, you know, a big fan. I mean, bombing down the left wing, getting the ball in. I mean, if you're a striker, it's a dream, isn't it? A guy like that, got, you know, putting a p inch perfect balls in all the time. You just need. I mean, imagine how Andy Carroll would feel if you had uh, Etherington <laughs> feeding him, you know. But uh, no, I mean, just uh, you know, a brilliant player. I remember his hammer of the year, and um, yeah, superb. I was sad when he left. Um, but as I say, sometimes you, you get some strange decisions at clubs and players that you like seem to go. But as uh, Matt said, there's a lot of other stuff going on with agents and managers, etc. So, um, yeah, and the Zola 
time was uh, was a strange one for a lot of different reasons. Mm. Um, and to be quite honest, I mean, I'd have kept Zola rather than Avram Grant uh, yeah. a million percent, you know. And uh, he perhaps needed some help on the defensive side, as Allardyce perhaps is having some on the attacking side, you know. Yeah. But um, no, I thought Zola was a great guy. He had all the West Ham traditions. He liked to play football the right way. Yeah, he had a and lot he, of good ideas. Though, yeah, and, and he was universally popular. So I think mm. if you'd backed him a little bit more and given him a bit more support, you know, he could have been a brilliant manager for us. Yeah. But, you know, the life's about decisions. Yeah. And, uh, there you go. So, looking ahead now to another tough fixture, this time against Man United. Obviously, it's not going to be easy, but I caught up with Brad Jerno from Man, U Man United fanzine, Republic of Mancunia, to get his thoughts going into that match. Obviously, one of the teams that have beaten us this season are Man United. Back earlier in the, uh, earlier in the campaign, you were 2-1 winners at Old Trafford. I think Rooney was sent off that day as well. Can you remember much of that game? I do, yeah. It was a very tough game, one of the toughest games that we had at Old Trafford this season. Uh, it was a daft sending off for Rooney, but even before then, West Ham played really well. Uh, and we, we considered ourselves pretty fortunate that day to get away with uh, the victory. I can remember a, a really good challenge by McNair towards the end, which prevented a certain goal. Uh, and yeah, as I say, I think we were, we were playing quite well. It was early days under Van Hal, but it was still a bit of a fortunate victory. Uh, we were very happy to take the points. And then finally, Brad, the, um, the fixture back at Upton Park. What are your predictions going into that match? Uh, I actually, I'm feeling pretty confident about this one. Um, I, I don't think there'll be too much in it, but I, I fancy us to, to win the game. Uh, we've had a, a couple of better performances recently. Um, I'm hoping West Ham forms are not quite there at the moment. I think you've won one in the last six. Um, but it, it's tight and it, it really could go over the way, to be honest. Excellent. Well, thanks, Brad. Um, best of luck for the game, but hopefully we, um, we come out of Vixers. Um, no, it's great chatting to you. <laughs> we'll see. No problem. Cheers, mate. So, following those comment comments from Brad, what are your thoughts going into the game against Man United? It's a game that West Ham, uh, they've not been in the best run of form lately, so it's a game that West Ham want to get a result from and I think need to get a result from if, if they have any aspirations of, of finishing in that top six this year. Uh, it'd be a tough game. United, for me, although they've only lost... One in 16, they've not been that impressive. So I think they're there for the taking. Louis van Gaal is getting results out of them. But I'm not sure about them at the back. I think they, they take chances. Um, so obviously going forward, they've got world-class players. But if West Ham can keep it tight at the back, which I'm sure um, they can, it's a game that it definitely can win without a doubt. Well, would you agree with that? I'd agree. I mean, I'd take a draw if, uh, if you had to put it on me now. But as I say, it's how we approach the game. If we're ambitious and we go for it and put it on them, then certainly they're vulnerable at the back. Uh, that absolutely, that, that's the case. Um, you know, so it's just a case of using using home advantage and really pushing home. But yeah, I'm I'm optimistic. I'd be very disappointed if we can't get at least a draw. Mm. Just on the Man United note, Matt, who's the best uh, Red Devil you came up against? Uh, I actually made my debut against Man United at Old Trafford against a treble team, and the, the midfield was Beckham, Scholes, Keane, Giggs. Uh, it's not quite <laughs> a few in there. Yeah, yeah so. Um, yeah, what a side. I, I'd say <sighs> Giggs. I, I've always loved Giggs. Mm. Oh, he played where I played as well, but what a player, what he's done for Man United, the trophy he's mm. won. Similar type of player to you. Yeah, I want to say I was quite as good as him, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I always modelled my game on him and I always love watching him play and uh, what a player. Mm. He says it all really, how, how good he was for Man United and only at one club as well. Well, now we're going to get a prediction from someone who didn't quite get it right last week, but has promised to be back on form this time around. It's the IMU's resident tipster, Chris Predicts. Hi, Liam. How are you doing? Very well, thanks, Chris. We're um, in the studio with Matt and Will. How are you? Oh, thank you, yeah. Look so I think to start off, we've got to ask you, what happened last week? You were uh, tipping us for a win, but we were far from getting anything like that result. Even a draw wasn't, uh, wasn't ever in the realms of possibility. So why did it go so wrong? Uh, it was just awful, to be honest. <laughs> First 10 minutes, I thought we started, but we were playing not too bad. But once we, as the game went on, we never had any like, attacking options. And I think once we lost our uh, Carroll and Jim, we were always up against it. So... Yeah, it's probably one of our worst displays away from home this season, I think. And do you think we're going to recover against Man United? Well, I'm a West Ham supporter, so I'm always optimistic. So, yeah, I do. I think I really think we can win this. 2-1. Two, 2-1 one. Two, one again. I'll go for 2-1 again. OK. Who's scoring this time? 
Well, I'm going to go for uh, Sacco and uh, Valencia. Sacco and Valencia? I think, yeah. yeah, I think defensively they're still suspect, man. You know, I think if we can bit a pace going forward, I think we can cause some trouble. Well, um, Sacco first scorer at seven to one sounds like a pretty good bet. Um, Will, what do you think? Well, Look I think looking that. at the odds there, um, if, if I was looking at it objectively as a, as a punter, I'd say either laying Man United at, at evens, so i.e. getting the West Ham win or a draw, uh, is a good price. Uh, but if you were asking me for a banker, I'd say both teams to score at 8-11. to 11. Um, I think Sacco 7-1 to one is, uh, is not a bad little pump for, for first scorer. But, um, yeah, probably colours to the mask, West Ham plus one on the Asian handicap, 5-6. to six. That's my pump. Excellent. So everyone's feeling very positive. Well, Chris, you better not let us down two weeks in a row. So the pressure's on. Let's hope you're right. Yeah, let's hope so. I won't be on next week. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is your last Come shot. on, you are. We can do it. Nice one. See you later, Chris. Thank you. Cheers. See you, man. See ya. What do you think of that prediction? Bold. Mm. But you've got to be confident, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I like the optimistic uh, fans, so mm -hmm. definitely. Is it every chance that can happen? I, I, I fancy a score draw, personally, but what do I know? <laughs> well, just to wrap up for this week, Matt, what are your plans for the future? Because I'm sure all West Ham fans will be very keen to know what you're getting up to now. Uh, not a lot, really. I'm, I'm doing my coaching badges uh, in the summer. I'm doing a little bit of media work here and there. Uh, just had a little baby girl, so I'm watching her grow up, which is amazing. Mm. Uh, when you're a footballer, you, you, a lot of time is consumed, obviously, playing, so you don't see your kids grow up. And luckily enough, uh, she was born in August, so I'm, I'm watching her grow up now. Uh, she's six months, and you know that's priceless. So uh, more of that and uh, see what happens in the future. I'm in no rush to do anything at the minute. I'm not um, you know, nailing my colours to, to any mouse. I'm, I'm just going to go with the flow and see what happens and, and, and take it from there. Well-deserved, timed off, I Thanks, think mate. everyone would agree. Excellent. Well, thank you to all my guests this week. Thanks to Matt, thanks to Will, and my two Skype callers, Brad and James. And of course, thank you to Chris Predicts. I think the only thing that's left to say is come on, you irons. Come, come on, you irons. irons.